and we'll get get we'll get through some of the introductions and and more folks i'm sure will will show up during that time but in the interest of the time that we have i, I am going to get started so depending on where you are again good morning or good afternoon everyone this is the fiscal year 2023 Community Project Funding Grantee Cohort Session 3, Environmental Review and uh, Review Process and Considerations. I am Patrick Roberts. I'm a consultant with Civics and recently have had the honor of working directly with some CPF program analysts, CPF grant officers, senior planning and development specialists, and the environmental clearance officer for HUD in developing some work aids for the environmental review process, some of whom are with us today, and I'll have them introduce themselves here in just a moment. But uh, first, would like to go through some of the logistics for the session. <clears throat> first, as usual, participants are going to be muted during the webinar. The PowerPoint presentation will be available on the HUD exchange. It, it may take a bit, but it will be available. Uh, also, it, so it'll be available here on, on the HUD exchange. Also on the HUD exchange is uh, an ask a question help desk for any type of question the, that you may have on your CPF grant. And then uh, one other thing just wanna share with you that uh, we really wanna highlight uh, for you all in case you have not been introduced to this is we want to encourage you all to sign up for listserv which is also on the HUD exchange this is going to be used more in the future to communicate everything that's new going on with the community project funding we'll be putting out notifications of new resources that get uploaded upcoming trainings webinars and other resources that should be helpful in implementing your CPF grant. So please create an account on the HUD exchange and sign up for the LiftServe to get all the most uh, updated information that is being provided by HUD. So for content questions during this presentation, please use the Zoom chat feature. We'll compile those. You're encouraged to submit your questions as we uh, step through this presentation while you're thinking of them. And then we'll answer them at the end. And anything that we need to follow up on, uh, we'll log those questions and answer them later. Okay, so as I mentioned, we have some folks with us today from HUD. Omri, if you're, if you're on, could you start off the introductions? Yes, thank you, Patrick. Um, so my name is Omri Gross. I am HUD's Program Environmental Clearance Officer for HUD's Community Planning and Development Programs, which includes the Community Project Funding Portfolio. Um, and I work uh, directly with uh, the Office of Economic Development, the Congressional Grants Division, as well as um, congressional staffers um, to uh, essentially work through some of the policy interpretations and compliance framework for environmental review for the community project funding program. This is a particularly nuanced program uh, compared to uh, some of our other HUD funding opportunities as it relates to environmental review. Um, so um, as I mentioned, you know, we've been working very closely um, to kind of develop this framework um, for environmental re review compliance uh, that considers uh, all of the nuances involved with the community project funding program. So very happy to be here. Um, very happy to work with Patrick, Chantel, Connor, um, and all of the team uh, that's been working tirelessly on this. Um, and I'll be around to uh, provide any support uh, and answer any questions um, that uh, we may have that, that Patrick is not able to answer as well. Thank you. Thank you, Omri. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Connor Leroux. Uh, I'm a program analyst with the Congressional Grants Division. Um, so I'm working alongside a few uh, grant officers and then also working on the technical assistance projects um, that we have for grantees, such as the cohorts that you're on right now. Um, so thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, Chantel James is actually on the other cohort session that's running concurrent to this one. So um, she's not here, but uh, we are um, very pleased that all you are continuing to attend these sessions. So thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Patrick. Very good. Thank you, Amory and, and Connor. As I mentioned, 
I'm Patrick Roberts. I'm a consultant with civics in, and I have experience in construction management as an administrative director responsible for the uh, implementation of projects from project design, working with local municipalities on uh, permitting onto funding through to the completion of the project, as well as working at the state and local government uh, level uh, with policy setting, working for the state of Iowa and New York in disaster recovery for program management, and then cross-cutting requirements, including environmental review. And being involved in construction and disaster recovery projects of all types where federal funding is involved, you learn early that it's essential to have a foundational understanding of, envir of the environmental review process, the many different concepts, requirements, and regulations that weave throughout that review process. So today we're going to do a review of the environmental review process. To some, this may be a refresher and it never hurts to have a refresher on environmental review. To others, this brief overview could be their introduction into that exciting world of environmental review. And hopefully everyone will be able to say that they've learned something that will benefit their project moving forward. The overview is going to cover a wide range of topics, starting with the, uh, starting with the questions of what is environmental review and ending with talking through some of the considerations for project, uh, for the community project funding. So let's get started. Jeez, sorry about that folks. What is environmental review? An environmental review is an analysis of impacts that a project will have on its surrounding environment and how that environment will affect the project. Incidentally, step one of the environmental review is to develop a detailed project description. And that detailed project description can also be a part of your project narrative. I'm sure you've been through that, that cohort as well on project narrative. So making the connection between some of the different resources provided. The completed review demonstrates that HUD funded projects have complied with all of the applicable laws and authorities and ensures that those projects provide decent, safe, and sanitary housing. An environmental review is required for all HUD-assisted projects and is a public document used to encourage public participation. And while all HUD-assisted projects require an environmental review, not all projects require the same level of effort to complete that review, which we'll take a look at on the next slide. So as I mentioned, not all projects require the same level of effort to complete that review. This slide includes a rough breakdown of each of the level of reviews and that are more common and, and to highlight the capacity and time and considerations. Projects require different levels of review based on the nature and scope of the project activity. So you can see that there are different levels of review starting from, from the left side here, there's the exempt CENST level of review, which stands for the categorically excluded, not subject to certain laws and authorities. These projects are more, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, are more soft cost related services, operational costs, and most maintenance activities. There aren't many laws and authorities that you have to address uh, for the exempt in the CNST. They have very limited compliance requirements. So you see down here, these can be done uh, pretty quickly. And we often see a lot more of these types of review because there are just a lot more activities within this kind of scope of soft costs that we see coming through. <clears throat> Next, we have the, the CEST level of review, which is categories excluded subject to. And these are subject to the laws and authorities of 24 CFR 58.5. These can be refinances, minor rehab, single family housing construction type projects. These are projects that uh, 
uh, more intense than the exempt CNST, but still smaller projects than the next level of review, which requires an environmental assessment. These are the larger multifamily construction projects, infrastructure projects, project types that go beyond just the minimal groundbreaking of the CEST project. These reviews uh, can take uh, a bit longer to review. They require compliance with all of the federal environmental laws and authorities, including the National Environmental Policy Act analysis, which is known as the Environmental Assessment Factors Analysis. These could take a bit longer, as I mentioned, and we see fewer projects at this level of review. And then uh, here to the right, we have the highest level of review, and that's the Environmental Impact Statement. These are extremely rare. Uh, these are large-scale infrastructure projects, projects with 2,500 plus housing units, some of these can be disaster related projects, but really we're not going to see very many of these types of projects in the community project funding program. Before we move on, one of, uh, a couple of things that I want you to take note of here is that the level of review is not dependent on the amount of funding involved in the project but it's dependent on the level of potential impact to the environment that the project may have. The other thing to take note of, as you can see here, we've, we've put down here the, the level or the capacity that is needed to complete these different levels of review. This is just a, for an awareness uh, idea of as you have a project, that has a higher level of impact to the environment, it's going to require additional time and staff capacity to complete those. On the next slide, showing the federal laws and authorities, and depending on your project's level of review, which we just discussed, a environmental review may have to consider a wide variety of environmental laws and authorities. This can include, again, the, the NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, could include the Endangered Species Act, historical preservation, site contamination, noise abatement, floodplain management, and on and on. <clears throat> Under NEPA and its implementing regulations, all federal agencies have a duty to assess the impacts of the major acts, uh, actions they propose to undertake and to consider reasonable alternatives to choose from to reduce or eliminate those impacts. As, as we step through this presentation, those alternatives will be referred to later as choices. So this, uh, this slide is, is the universe of the environmental laws and authorities that your project may need to comply with. So let's touch briefly on 2 CFR Part 58 and 24 CFR Part 50, which refer to the regulations that govern the environmental review process that you all need to complete for your projects. Environmental reviews for projects under Part 58 are completed by a unit, a general unit of local government in which the project is located in. The unit of general government serves as the responsible entity and conducts the environmental review for the project. See, uh, the community project funding legislation allows for environmental reviews to be completed under part 58 by a unit of general local government as the responsible entity. And this is really the default for the CPF program. We should all be doing everything that we can to encourage that unit of general local government in which the project is located in to serve as the responsible entity and conduct the environmental review whenever possible. However, sometimes, the nonprofit recipients cannot secure a local government responsible entity to conduct their review 
and may need to reach out to HUD to complete the review under Part 50. And we'll talk about Part 50 in, in a little bit. So under Part 58, the grantee, the recipient, provides all the necessary information to the local uh, government entity acting as the responsible entity to complete the environmental review for the project. This may involve hiring uh, an environmental consultant to essentially collect, gather, and compile all that information and provide it to the responsible entity. This will really be a call between you and the local government as to whether or not they have the staff capacity to conduct the environmental review or if you need to hire an environmental consultant to essentially do the legwork, compile all of that content. Then uh, once that information is compiled, the, uh, the local government would independently review and verify it. If a project rises to the, uh, the CEST or the categorically excluded subject to, or to the environmental assessment uh, level of review, which we covered uh, in, in a previous slide, you know, where we went through those different levels of review, the, uh, the local government responsible entity would need to publish a public notice of finding from the environmental review. They'd need to publish a notice of intent to request to release funds and then to allow for the appropriate public comment period to then collect and address any comments received from the public. This publishing of, uh, of that notice informs the public that this is the project that the local government is doing in environmental review for and is informing the public of any impacts that the project may have. So after the local government waits that appropriate comment period after publishing those notices, then the responsible entity, that local government, would submit a request for release of funds to HUD. HUD then waits 15, has a 15-day objection period. And after that objection period, if there are no objections, HUD will issue an authority to use grant funds. <clears throat> and then the grantee uh, provides a copy of that authorization to use grant funds to their grant officer and provides a copy also to their environmental officer. So once the authorization to use grant funds has been received and shared with the grant officer and environmental officer, the grantee can then proceed with the project. As you notice uh, over here, the grantee, the responsible entity or grantee that is also responsible to implement any mitigation if required. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a coming slide. But this is the process for an environmental review when a project is under part 58, which again, part 58 is when the local government conducts the environmental review and that's the default for the CPF projects. Uh, there are a couple of differences between the environmental review process of part 58, where the local government conducts that review, and for part 50, where HUD conducts the review, which we'll talk about here on the next slide. Part 50 is the, is the regulation that governs when HUD conducts the environmental review instead of the local government. Again, part 58, when the local government conducts the review, now part 58, grantees request HUD conducts the review and provides all the necessary requested project information to the HUD environmental officer. Again, it's still up to the grantee to provide all the information requested and necessary to complete the environmental review. The environmental review officer then completes the review, conducts any necessary consultations with uh, any environmental authorities, and then they certify and approve the review. 
after that, <clears throat> the environmental review officer will provide a copy of the environmental review record to the grant division grant officer, who will then provide a copy to the grantees. So the grantee has a copy of that environmental review record. And then once the environmental review has been approved and the grantee has a copy of that environmental record, the grantee can then proceed with the project. Again, also must implement and monitor any mitigation that's prescribed by the environmental review. <clears throat> so if the review is done under part 50 and HUD is conducting the review, HUD will inform the grantee if there are any mitigation measures that need to be implemented. And mitigation describes an effort that agencies must make to avoid or minimize the environmental impacts resulting from the project. Want to, uh, want to have you take note here in this graphic that unlike part 58, where the local government conducts the review and informs the public and then requests the release of funds and HUD is issuing that authority to use grant funds, that process under part 50 doesn't exist where HUD is conducting that review because essentially HUD is already certifying that the review is approved. So we don't need to go through that additional approval process with HUD. <clears throat> Apologies. Don't know what's happening there. Well, this may may uh, seem like it would take less time under Part 50 where HUD is conducting the environmental review. Just want to keep in mind that HUD's environmental staff capacity to take on large numbers of Part 50 reviews is limited. So we do encourage environmental reviews for the CPF projects to remain under Part 50 where the local government responsible entity can complete that review. Before we move to the next slide, I just want to do a quick recap to this point that a couple of, couple of items. One, the environmental review is conducted to determine if the project will have an impact on the environmental surroundings, as well as to determine if the environment will have any impact on the project. There are different levels of review depending on the type of project you have. There are two different primary regulations that govern the environmental review process for HUD. That's part 58 and part 50. An environmental review must have a responsible entity and a satisfactory review process must be completed before the funds to cover the project costs can be released. Terms that I want you to be listening for as we go forward our legislative enactment, federal nexus, free nexus contract date, and choice limiting actions. So this, uh, this slide here is about the date of, of legislative enactment. So this is an important date for your CPF project and the grant. This is the date that con Congress appropriated the funds for the community uh, project funding for that fiscal year. The reason that this is important is because any costs that are incurred or activities that are performed prior to the date of that legislative enactment are not eligible for repayment and do not need to be included in the environmental review for the project. Again, any costs that were incurred or activities performed prior to the date of legislative enactment for your fiscal year is not eligible for repayment and it does not need to be included in the environmental review for the project. For this group, the date of legislative enactment is, for fiscal 23 is December 29, 2022. <clears throat> this, uh, this slide here talks about the federal nexus and choice limiting actions. The federal nexus is the point at which a project becomes federalized and when federal environmental review requirements are triggered. The federal nexus for fiscal year 2023 again is December 29th, 29th 2022. 
Uh, if you also attended the environmental review session for uh, the 2022 cohort, cohorts, that federal nexus information shared was different for fiscal 2022. So we had a, um, sorry, we had a date of uh, legislative enactment and a federal nexus date that were different. For 2023, those dates are the same. So this session, it's for fiscal 2023. The important date is December 29, 2022. The grantees, uh, local government responsible entity, or HUD, will be required to complete a satisfactory environmental review covering all work that took place or is proposed to take place after that federal nexus date. And the environmental review needs to be completed prior to requesting payment from HUD for those activities. I had uh, I had mentioned uh, a while back, uh, a few slides back, the concept of reasonable alternatives. And I had shared that under NEPA and its implementing regulations that all federal agencies have a duty to assess the impacts of the major actions they propose to undertake and to consider reasonable alternatives to choose from to reduce or eliminate those impacts. These alternatives, and I had mentioned that those alternatives would be referred to later as, as choices. We've arrived at that at later point in the presentation. So after that federal nexus, grantees are prohibited from taking new choice limiting actions related to hard costs, including commitment or expenditure of HUD or non-HUD funds until a satisfactory review has been completed for the project. <clears throat> so if the environmental review has not been completed, then that analysis of reasonable alternatives to choose from has not been completed either. By taking an action that essentially binds the project to a narrowed course or cutting off possibilities of alternatives, by doing so prior to completing the environmental review, that is considered a choice limiting action. So that action is any activity that the grantee undertakes, including commitment or expending HUD funds that reduces or eliminates a grantee's opportunity to choose project alternatives that could avoid or minimize environmental impacts. There is one nuance to this that is an important one, but we'll cover that in just a moment. This prohibition on choice limiting actions is true for all soft and hard cost activities and actions unless those actions are part of a pre-federal nexus contractual obligation, <clears throat> which again, I'll talk about in just uh, more as we go on, but essentially this prohibition on taking choice limiting actions is in effect for all soft and hard costs and activities and actions that are carried out after the federal nexus. Some examples of choice limiting actions would be entering uh, uh, into a contract for uh, acquisition or rehabilitation, demolition, new construction, ground disturbance such as clearing, grading, grubbing, uh, again, entering into contracts or commitments for hard cost work. Construction of any other hard cost is a choice limiting action. These actions limit your choices of project alternatives. So if you've already, uh, say, acquired land or a site, you're committing to that site. You're committing the project to that specific site. And that's why it's a choice limiting action, because you're limiting the choice of alternatives. Same thing with, uh, with leasing a structure or a property rehab, conducting rehab, performing rehab in a particular building, anything uh, you've been, anything that you've done like that, you're limiting your choice of doing this project in another location. Same thing with demolition. 
if you've already demolished a structure, or if you're constructing a new structure, you're limiting yourself to that site. <clears throat> so those are, again, examples of choice limiting actions that cannot be taken after the federal nexus until the environmental review is complete. That's kind of, that's the, the purpose of the environmental review is to evaluate a site and its conditions and alternatives before you take those types of actions. So the, the nuance after the federal nexus grantees are taking, excuse me, they're, they're prohibited from taking new choice limiting actions except for activities that are part of a pre-nexus contractual obligation until a satisfactory environmental review has been completed for the aggregated pro uh, project. Although activities that were committed to under a pre-nexus contract are technically allowed, physical actions taken after the nexus may prevent a satisfactory environmental review from, from being done, which would prevent drawdown of grant funds. So all activities performed after the federal nexus are subject to a satisfactory environmental review in order for the project to be eligible for payment. So we're gonna do a, a quick recap of um, on, on all of that was a lot. Activities committed after the nexus date, but associated with a pre-nexus contract are one, technically allowed, two, will not be considered choice limiting actions, three, still need to be cleared as part of the environmental review, and four, are activities taken at the grantee's own risk. And we'll talk again about pre-nexus contracts later in the presentation as, as it relates to cost eligibility. I'm gonna move on to and talk some about uh, soft costs a little bit more in detail here. So soft costs, most soft costs, as it says, there are covered under part 50 of HUD's nationwide programmatic review for soft costs. HUD conducted a nationwide programmatic environmental review for the entire CPF program that again covers most, but not all soft cost activities. And you'll be able to find some links to, uh, or find these links or use these links actually in uh, from this slide, as well as on the CPF landing page. And you'll see a list of which soft costs are covered in the project description of that environmental review record. So you can just click on that link, pull up the nationwide environmental review record that HUD conducted for soft costs, and you'll see all of the, the types of soft costs that are covered in that review. In general, it includes planning, administrative, and operating costs, maintenance costs that comply with HUD's notice 16.02, which you can see there uh, in the link, um, is the guidance for categorizing an activity as maintenance for compliance with HUD environmental relations. So maintenance activities that comply with that notice are covered by HUD Part 50 review for soft costs. And with recent legislation, legislative changes that were enacted for both fiscal years la um, last year, there is no longer a cap on how much of your CPF grant can go towards soft costs. However, if you intend to repurpose your grant um, as a as 100% soft costs, you must get approval from your grant officer to see if that's appropriate and a potential path forward. So 
as it says, most soft costs are covered, so not all soft costs are covered. <clears throat> There's a, um, but those that are covered, excuse me, those that are covered by HUD's nationwide environmental review can be incurred any time after the date of legislative enactment or federal nexus, which occurred on, again, December 29, 2022, and can be drawn down for repayment after the grant agreement for the project has been executed. Mentioning that the nationwide environmental review uh, covered most soft costs, there are obviously some co soft costs that are not covered. And if you have those types of soft costs in your project that are not covered, you'll need to complete a separate exempt or CENST determination and have that done by the responsible entity or by HUD prior to incurring those costs. You need to have that done before you can start incurring those non-covered soft costs. It's essentially a determination that the costs that weren't included in that nationwide uh, review, uh, it's a, a determination that you are in compliance with the laws and authorities. It's a quick uh, environmental review process. And uh, so we'll talk more about those soft costs that are not covered on the next slide. So this next, uh, next slide provides a, a breakdown of the types of soft costs and activities that are and are not covered by HUD's Part 50 review for the CPF soft costs. It also provides their corresponding regulatory citation as well. So covered soft costs include environmental and other studies, resource identification, development of plans and strategies, information and financial advisory, administrative and management expenses, public services, inspection and testing for properties for hazard defects, purchasing of insurance, engineering or design costs, technical assistance and training, supportive services, operating, my apologies again, folks, Operating costs, including most maintenance, purchase of vehicles, but not other equipment. So those are all the soft costs that are covered by HUD's Part 50 Nationwide Environmental Review. Some of the activities that are not covered that would require that separate environmental review determination, which again can be done fairly quickly, and it can be separate from the larger environmental review considerations of the whole project, but it still needs to be put in place by the responsible entity. So the soft costs that are not covered by HUD's Part 50 Nationwide Environmental Review Record include the purchase of tools, emergency assistance necessary to control or arrest the effects of disasters or imminent threats to public safety, tenant-based rental assistance, economic development activities, affordable housing, pre-development costs, and then approval of supplemental assistance. Now, the reason that some of these soft costs are not covered by HUD's nationwide review is because there is a chance they may require compliance with one or more laws or authorities, which will depend on the nature, extent, and or location of the activity, which HUD could not account for in the nationwide review. It would be difficult for HUD to know where all the projects would be located and to know what the environmental conditions of the project would be. <clears throat> Excuse me, HUD could only do this kind of broad level nationwide environmental review record to, cons uh, to cover certain soft costs because some of those other costs, again, may require that additional compliance with, for instance, the flood insurance requirement. So HUD completed that nationwide review for all soft costs that would clear that HUD could clear at a nationwide level 
but then had to leave out those soft costs that may require compliance with one or two laws and authorities that HUD was not able to ensure compliance with at the nationwide level. And if, if you have any additional questions about whether your soft costs are covered or not, or if they would require their own environmental review, please reach out and discuss with your environmental officer. And uh, we'll give you a, a link at the end that'll have some of that uh, contact information. This next slide uh, it has a table uh, from HUD's notice on categorizing activities as maintenance for the purpose of environmental review. And I apologize, this slide seems to be quite large for the for the setting here. Um, there's a, a, the top half here, it has a, um, uh, a column on the right here that uh, is listed as rehab. And hmm. so the far right column under rehab, these are not covered by HUD's nationwide review. It would need to be included in a satisfactory environmental review for the project prior to being uh, conformed. The middle column is a column for under maintenance. And these, except for the ones at the bottom here with the asterisks, these are all covered by HUD Part 50 environmental review for soft costs. These activities can be incurred at any time after the date of enactment for your fiscal year grant and would not need to be covered by a separate project specific environmental review prior to incurring those costs. So for those activities that are marked by an asterisk, such as the installation or replacement of carpeting or vinyl floor, down here, you can see it's the last one under flooring. It has an asterisk near it. Those activities are not covered by HUD's Part 50 nationwide review for soft cost either because they may require the purchase of flood insurance if they occur in a special flood hazard area. And the cost would have, uh, if the cost exceeded the standard deductible, for the specific type of structure or unit under the National Flood Insurance Program. So you can, you can see that uh, there's that additional possible layer, additional layer of review that's needed. And that's why that could not be included or covered under HUD's Part 58 or 50 nationwide review. So moving on to the hard costs and how to handle work that was already under contract. This is the, the one of those terms that I mentioned earlier about a pre-nexus contract or pre-nexus contractual obligation. And how do we handle that? So following the federal nexus, no party may enter into an additional construction contract or take other new choice limiting commitments or actions, including spending funds or performing physical work until the environmental review process is complete and all necessary approvals are received. Following the federal nexus, no party may enter into additional construction contracts or take other new choice limiting actions until the environmental review process is complete and all necessary approvals are received. Wanted to say that, say that a couple of times to let that sink in because now I'm gonna talk about the caveat is regarding work under an existing pre-nexus contractual obligation. 
So grantees are technically allowed to undertake physical work under contractual obligations that were entered into prior to the federal nexus, and they can incur those activity costs that are or were performed anytime after the federal nexus as hard costs, and they could potentially be eligible for repayment, but they do all of that at their own risk. The reason is because if you, if you as a grantee had already entered into a contractual obligation prior to the project becoming federalized, prior to that federal nexus date, HUD really can't tell you outright that you cannot move forward with that project. You have a contractual obligation to move forward with those activities. Now, it's still best practice, and HUD will always encourage that best practice of stopping all work after the federal nexus, if at all possible. And this is because even though you are allowed to move forward and perform activities after the federal nexus that are associated with a pre-nexus contractual obligations, grantees, again, would be doing that at their own risk. That's because all work that has or will take place after the federal nexus, regardless of your pre-nexus contractual obligation status, all of that work that has or will take place must be covered by a satisfactory environmental review for the project to be eligible for repayment. And you can also find additional insights on this because that's that's a lot in there also. There are additional insights that can be found with that guidance from HUD to, to the CPF grantees on page two and three of the fiscal 23 community project funding environmental guidance and scenarios. So we mentioned that a satisfactory environmental review uh, must be completed. What is a, what do we mean by a satisfactory environmental review? A satisfactory environmental review must include an analysis of the applicable environmental laws and authorities, has to include a determination that the project activities will not result in environmental harm that cannot be mitigated. Three, must include a com um, complete all consultation with federal and state agencies in a manner that allows for mitigation measures and conditions to be implemented. And as applicable, the request for release of funds certification for the project that has been approved by the HUD office is required. So if a satisfactory review must cover all related project activities performed after the federal nexus, except for those soft costs that are incurred by HUD's Part 50 nationwide review for CPF costs. HUD has already uh, completed that satisfactory review for all those covered soft costs, but um, a satisfactory environmental review must cover all related project activities performed after that federal nexus, December 29, 2022. I'm going to, uh, to jump ahead to the, uh, to the CPF process flow. This, this is a, a flow chart for the CPF process uh, for the fiscal year 2023, which many of you may already be familiar with. This uh, particular graphic can be found in the CPF Guidance and Scenarios document on the HUD Exchange as well. It offers a visual breakdown of when both soft and hard costs are allowed to be incurred and when grantees can request payment for those activities in relation to the environmental review and grant uh, agreement execution process. So key, takeaway, key takeaways here for fiscal 2023, are grantees are allowed to incur Incur covered soft costs from the date of enactment, uh, December 29, 2022, but these soft costs must be covered by HUD's Part 50 Nationwide Environmental Review for CPF costs. 
And if you have soft costs that are covered, then you can incur those. And again, HUD encourages all physical work to stop after that federal nexus until the environmental review can be complete. This next slide is uh, a logic tree that we put together to assist grantees and grant officers in quickly and easily determining which project costs are eligible for repayment. Soft costs on, on this side, you'll see incurred before December 29, 2022, not eligible. Incurred after, eligible. For hard costs, if you incurred those before December 29, uh, 2022, they are not eligible. For hard costs incurred after, these are the this is the nuance, incurred after the ER process is complete, they are eligible. If they were incurred before ER process is complete and a contract was executed after December 29, 2022, they are not eligible. But for incurred before the environmental review process with a contractual obligation in place before that nexus date and physical work took place after December 29, 2022, they could be eligible. These are uh, these are some of the considerations that that we talked through in uh, in this uh, slide presentation that uh, get to the heart of that environmental review uh, process as well as the ability to um, to the ability and eligibility of soft and hard costs in relation to the nexus date and the, the contract date. So any hard cost activities performed completed prior to the enactment date, not eligible for repayment, not included in the scope of the environmental review. Soft cost activities performed prior to the date of legislative enactment in the federal nexus, also not eligible for repayment. Any pre-nexus contractual obligations that involve hard costs to be performed after the federal nexus date. Best practice is to stop all that physical work, but grantees can proceed at their own risk with performing those activities that are part of a pre-nexus contractual obligation. And any contracts, commitments entered into or choice limiting actions taken following the federal nexus if so, this would constitute a choice limiting action violation and should be referred to your regional environmental officer for next steps. This next slide is that, uh, that resource slide that I had mentioned uh, earlier on. So here you can find a lot of great environmental review resources specific to the community project funding. You've got that guidance and scenarios uh, documenting the environmental review for CPF grants, cost charts that we looked at. This is a training series that uh, has recordings on there that uh, folks can watch. These are two links that we saw in uh, the presentation as well. And then a host of additional environmental review resources and general environmental resources there. <clears throat> That, uh, that concludes the, uh, the presentation and uh, looking to see if we received any questions or if there are any discussion items that, uh, that we could touch on. Yeah, Patrick, here uh, at the end. if I can jump in here. First yes. of all, great presentation. This is Omri Gross, I'm the Program Environmental Clearance Officer for, for HUD's CPT programs, uh, including this program. Um, and yeah, we got a ton of questions, great questions in the chat um, that I have been working through uh, responding to. Um, so I think I got most of them so far, but there are a couple that have come in since. Um, so I'll just uh, start rifling these off and, and trying to address them. Um, I won't go through the ones that I've already answered. People can go through the chat, um, maybe if we have time, um, but people can go through the chat and look at those as well. And I'm sure that you'll provide a, you know, a, um, 
some detail and and perhaps even a written uh, Q and A uh, to to share those responses. Yes. Um, but yeah, so there's a question right now uh, that I haven't answered yet, um, which is from uh, Kareen. Hopefully, I've said that correctly, Kareen Friedman. Um, and it is, can you provide some scenarios of what options are available if a project cannot obtain a satisfactory environmental review? and what the repurposing of funds would look like. So there are several situations in which, as uh, Patrick has gone over, in which a grantee and a project may not be able to obtain a satisfactory environmental review. So one of those situations is um, if, for instance, um, a choice living action uh, was taken uh, after the federal nexus, um, that's a choice living action violation, um, and in certain situations, um, you know, basically the project can't proceed as is. Also, for instance, if uh, there was a pre-Nexus contractual obligation to perform work after the federal Nexus, and again, we always say that you're technically allowed to do this, even though best practice is to stop all work until the environmental review is complete, um, but but you can do this at your own risk if, it, if you do have a contractual obligation, a pre-Nexus contractual obligation in place. Um, but in certain situations, like for instance, let's say you have a pre-Nexus contractual obligation to demolish a structure after the federal nexus. Technically, you can proceed with demolishing that structure after the federal nexus because you're contractually obligated to do it. We can't stop you from doing it. But let's say that that uh, structure ends up being a historic structure. Uh, and then that precludes your ability to consult with the state historic preservation office, they won't even consult with you because you demolished a historic property after the federal nexus. Yes, you had a contract in place to do that, but you did it after the project was federalized. And this is a state authority. And we defer to them on the section 106 historic review process. And so if they say that they were not willing to consult because you demolished a structure after the federal nexus and that it could have been historic or it was historic, um, then that could be a situation where you are not able to achieve a satisfactory environmental review because the state historic preservation office won't consult with you on it essentially. So in that situation, and for whatever reason, if you are unable to complete a satisfactory environmental review, that's just one example, um, there, the project essentially cannot be funded as it is uh, described in the uh, congressional appropriations. And so you'll have to reach out to your grant officer, explain you know, that essentially we're not able to complete a satisfactory environmental review, and ask what options are available to repurpose the funds. And the repurposing of funds involves uh, your grant officer coordinating with the congressional rep that ad allocated this funding and with the grantee to see what activities, usually we're talking about soft cost activities here. Um, and usually we're talking about soft cost activities that are covered by HUD's Part 50 nationwide review for soft cost for CPF. Um, and so essentially because HUD completed that nationwide soft cost review for all CPF grants for certain soft cost activities, um, and we did so, back all the way back from the date of legislative enactment, then that means that if you, if the grantee, if you as the grantee have a lot of soft cost activities that you could repurpose the funds in that grant um, to essentially go to 100% soft costs. And that may require some update to the language in your project description in the JES, the Joint Explanatory Statement, which is the Congressional Appropriations Document. Um, and so there may be, there may need to be a process essentially where, you know, they up Congress updates the language of that project description um, so that essentially all of those funds can go to soft costs. Like for instance, if, if the project description said, you know, construction of a new development, right, then they may need to update that language to say, you know, soft costs or, you know, pr uh, planning and admin, you know, to support X, Y, Z. Um, so that's kind of what that process looks like. Um, and again, in most situations, if you do run into a situation where you're unable to achieve a satisfactory environmental review, this is kind of the main way out, right, is to see if you can repurpose those funds um, so that they all go towards soft costs to support the project um, for which we HUD has already completed an environmental review all the way back to the date of legislative enactment. So anything after the date of legislative enactment, um, you can essentially incur the covered soft costs from that date. Um, so that has been kind of a, a way out um, for a lot of the situations that we've run into where a uh, satisfactory environmental review uh, was not achievable. And just one note on that is that 
the satisfactory environmental review piece, you know, again, because of the unique nature of this program, oftentimes it's not the grantees issue, right? If they run into a situation where they're unable to achieve a satisfactory environmental review, sometimes that's just how it's going to pan out with the uh, unusual nature of this program where where projects are un already underway, um, sometimes even completed um, before the legislative enactment, before the federal nexus. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Corrine. Um, and then I see another question here um, that, uh, hello, are, are there any other conditions in part uh, of this process for homeless shelter facilities? Um, so I'm not exactly sure what uh, what this question, uh, what you're trying to get to uh, with this question, um, homeless shelter facilities, you know, it, it depends on, you know, exactly if it's, is it new construction of a homeless shelter facility? Is it supportive services for a homeless shelter facility? Like if it's new construction, right, it's all based on um, the actual activity being performed, right? If the activity is a hard cost activity, like, such as new construction of a homeless shelter facility, then it's going to require a higher level of review. If it's just providing admin or planning or supportive services uh, for a homeless shelter activity, then it's likely going to be covered under our HUD Part 50 uh, soft cost review, nationwide soft cost review, right? So it's really going to come down to, you know, what are the exact activities involved in the project? Um, and you can always reach out to your regional environmental officer if you have any of these types of questions um, as far as level of review or what conditions uh, apply to certain types of activities. And then I see a question here, is the grantee ever responsible for paying for the environmental review? Yes, the grantee should be paying for the cost of preparing an environmental review. When you reach out to your uh, responsible entity, you know, depending on who your unit of general local government is, um, some units of general local government are much bigger. They have a lot you know, more capacity. They have a lot more experience conducting environmental review. They may already conduct HUD environmental reviews. Some of them don't. They don't have the capacity. They don't have the experience. And they may need you as the grantee to pay for an environmental consultant to prepare the content of the environmental review um, and to do the legwork. Um, and so really, yes, it is the grantee's responsibility. You may use your grant funds. It is a covered soft cost activity to pay for the cost of preparing an environmental re review, including the cost of hiring an environmental consultant um, to prepare the content of that review. Where the unit of general local government co really comes in as the responsible entity um, is that they are the ones that have to independently review and verify the content of the environmental review. So if you know it's well within their right as a responsible entity to ask you as the grantee to foot the bill um, for you know for instance paying for an environmental consultant to put the environmental review together and do all that legwork and so that the, the local government responsible entity can just independently review and verify the content of that review um, that, you know, perhaps an environmental consultant, you paid it, the grantee paid an environmental consultant to, to prepare. Um, now, the responsible, the unit of general local government responsible entity also must be the one that uh, initiates any consultation if it's necessary, like, for instance, with the State Historic Preservation Office. If consultation is necessary, um, it has to come officially from the unit of general local government, uh, the responsible entity. Um, so again, the grantee and, and, and perhaps their environmental consultant can help prepare those documents, the, a letter, you know, an official letter to the State Historic Preservation Office to initiate consultation, but it has to be signed and come from uh, the unit of general local government responsible entity. And then I see one more question here and uh, Patrick, feel free, you know, if we need to stop here, I'm not sure exactly how long we go here, but, you know, feel free to jump in here if we need to stop it. I'll, I'll keep going otherwise. Um, and so the next question is, if you've made a choice limiting action, but can still provide a successful environmental review, are you limited to soft costs slash sacrificing your grant? Now, that is a great question. Um, and it, there is a nuanced answer to that. And so in general, I would say if you have made, if you are aware that you have taken a choice limiting action, um, that you should immediately reach out to your regional environmental officer um, and make sure that your grant officer is also aware. Um, but your regional environmental officer will, will be able to kind of help through, parse through what exactly happened and whether or not it's what we call a regulatory or a statutory violation. Um, a statutory violation, there's no real coming back from that. Um, and, uh, 
and it's not and we essentially you know we're, our hands are tied if a statute is violated which essentially means that you know you either uh uh entered into committed hud funds explicitly after the federal nexus with before you've done an environmental review or you've ex spent hud funds um uh, or taken certain actions uh, using HUD funds um, after the federal nexus has passed um, that are not associated with a pre-nexus contractual obligation. And then there are certain criteria for a regulatory violation. Um, that's more of like if you've taken certain actions like choice living actions, um, but you did not explicitly commit HUD funds, maybe you use non-HUD funds to take those actions, that would be considered a regulatory violation. And there is a process in place to work through a regulatory violation. It is not guaranteed. It is a can be a lengthy process. So if timelines are an issue, uh, timing is an issue, then you know that's something that you need to take into account as well. And again, it is not guaranteed that the project will be approved, right? So again, it is a nuanced topic, um, the choice limiting action front. Um, and so if you are aware, if it comes to your attention that a choice making action may have been taken um, after the federal nexus for your project, um, the first thing to do is reach out to your regional environmental officer. They will ask you the right questions and they'll let you know what your options are. All right. I think that's all the questions um, that I haven't answered either through uh, the chat um, or vocally here. Um, so uh, unless there's anything else, um, which I'm not seeing anything else pop up, um, I'll turn it back over to you, Patrick. Very good. Um, thank you so much for uh, answering those questions in the chat as well as the questions afterwards. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we will be working to put together a uh, the frequently asked questions uh, list or the, uh, the Q&A from this session and work to get those out to uh, the cohorts, uh, the folks attending and be able to make that as a, as a resource as well. Um, want to then also uh, remind folks that uh, we do have office hours for the environmental review that will be happening uh, next Tuesday, a week from today, also from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern. And I believe that invitations and communications on on that uh, that session have gone out or will be going out shortly. So be watching for that as well as another opportunity to ask uh, additional questions and get answers to those. So again, want to uh, want to thank everyone for their attendance today. Thank you for uh, Connor and, and uh, Amory for both being here as well. And uh, I guess that uh, that will wrap up this session. Thank you all again. Thank you.